Everyone, it's David Bombal back with Micah and Griffin. Guys, welcome. Thanks, David. Hey, David. Great to have you guys here. I'm really excited about this video. Just for everyone who hasn't seen our previous videos, I've linked them below. Free course that you can get from your website. Is that right? That's right. The uh, introduction to OSINT training um, has a uh, huge amount of people that have started taking it to, to get into the OSINT world. Uh, it's free. Two hours of great content that Griffin and I made. Yeah, we really wanted to be welcoming to the huge audience of people that are interested in open source intelligence, right? And you know, not not put that content in a place where you can't access it or you have to pay for it and things like that. So this is out there for everyone to check out. Uh, we really want to show you what's possible and get people interested and excited in the craft. In a in an investigation, at one point, I was tasked with locating an individual from a series of photos, and I had photos from an event. And while I didn't have any information about who that person was, I was able to take contextual information from that event and the other things happening there and locate a, a nexus of people that were associated with the event. And through that research, I was trying to discern who the person was that was in these photos with all these different people, you know, my, my target of interest. And as I started going through people's social media accounts and getting names of family members and associates and spouses and working my way through that network to try and identify this one particular guy, I was having a hard time finding data on the person that I ended up feeling very confident was my suspect. And the reason is because he had very little online digital presence. And I wonder if that was by design, I'm not sure, but in doing the the investigative steps that I take going through different search engine research and different online databases and things like that, I was able to identify a social media account that had his given name on it and a username attached to it. No other information, no photograph, nothing useful, very bare bones, and most people would probably close that tab and move on. I took that username and I prepended it to various at gmail.com, at hotmail.com, and things like that as I was checking to see a presence of an email address associated with that person's possible username. Using the Epios email tool, I was able to find an email address associated with um, accounts that this service detected by making that guess with his username. And one of those services had a profile page that had his photo on it that was a dead match for the guy I was looking for. In fact, he was wearing the same shirt in a surveillance image that we had. So I was able to put those pieces together and connect the dots on him in a very roundabout way. But knowing that a tool like Epios could do this kind of search for me allowed me to take my instinct, my, my hope, right, that I might be able to guess this email address and do the work to find the associated accounts and make that validation. Really grateful that you guys have done that, you know, for helping the community. So for everyone who's watching, link below for the free course and the other videos. But I'm really excited about today's video. We've been talking about this for a long time. It's nice to talk about OSINT, but I think a question a lot of people have is, okay, what tools are they? Like practically, you know, is there something that I can start using today? And I believe you guys have got like a top 10 or something, fantastic tools to use in OSINT. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. So OSINT is definitely enabled by tooling, right? And and real open source intelligence work involves the, the analyst mindset and the intelligence cycle and sort of the collecting, processing and analyzing of that data. But the part that everybody really likes is the tools, right? Yeah. You you want to you want to have that cool website that finds the piece of information for you, or you want to have that awesome browser extension that, you know, creates efficiency in your work for some kind of repeatable process. And so when we put this list together, we really tried to think about what's going to be accessible to all of you, right? Everybody who's watching this video, it doesn't do me any good to show you some awesome tool that I pay a lot of money for that, you yeah. know, it doesn't fit your type of work. So we really focused on tools that are freely accessible. Um, and we tried to cover a wide range of topics uh, in open source intelligence as far as what their functions are and how they can help your work. Uh, but we want you to walk away from this video with 10 things you can do today or try out in your open source intelligence work. And people need to understand what a tool is in OSINT. I know that coming from cyber, a tool was a script or an app or something that you ran on your system. And tools in, in OSINT can be like that too, but in general, a lot of them are up in your browser. Uh, it might be a website that you visit, or it might be a browser plugin or add-on or extension like Griffin mentioned. So please understand that that uh, OSINT tool uh, goes by a lot of different names. And we're going to show you mostly ones are up in your browser with a couple of exceptions, and uh, they're all free. Even though Griffin and I do use paid tools, some amazing paid tools in our daily work. So that's great. I mean, I think it's important to differentiate between like people who are studying or starting out and people who do this professionally. So it'd be great to hear like, I can solve with this tool, but then also give us like the, 
the nuclear option for lack of a better word, you know, like what you guys really use out there. So I'm gonna keep quiet now, you guys take it away. All right, so our first tool is gonna to be, um, this is our number one tool, and partly it's because of, of the usefulness in the field and partly because I helped make it. Um, this is what's my name, uh, and if you go, I know, you gotta promote your own stuff, right, David? Of course. Uh, so this is no, what's I just say this for everyone who's watching, sorry to interrupt Micah, Micah is way too humble. He like comes across as this humble guy, but I this Mike is amazing and it's written a whole bunch of stuff. So cyber background, you've done coding, you've created all these amazing products that people can use for free. So I'll just say that, Mike, I gotta plug your stuff because you're way too humble. My advice to everyone is, you know, don't make Micah or Griffin upset because they'll find you. Um, <laughs> just like in a movie, right? But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. I have a certain set of skills, David. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, What's my name that app was originally created by me as a Python script and it got like 50 people using it. And then OSINT Combine, Chris Poulter did an amazing job making and hosting this website. And now it gets 50,000 views a day. It's a free tool and it's amazing. The, the simple uh, way that you use it is just take a username or usernames that you are, are looking to find where they are on the internet and you put it into the little field here. So I'm gonna just put in here mad for miracle max, just this random name. If I wanted to put other ones, I could. Um, it'll do multiple at the same time. Very, very important piece of it is this categories and filters. We've got all of the 600 plus sites that this will check through your browser categorized. So if you only wanna do a subset of that, like coding ones or, or uh, political sites, you can select that. Or if you wanna do all of them, including the ones that are not safe for work, choose all. We do that because some of the sites that this tool checks uh, are pornographic in nature. There's Pornhub and XHamster and other ones because some of the places where people have accounts that we might need to find for missing, exploited, trafficked people may be on those types of sites. So yeah. all we do is we hit the green button here and then let my browser do the work. My browser is now visiting 629 different sites and it's found 16 possible hits for the uh, username Mad for Miracle Max. The way this tool works is really simple. It just takes those URLs like twitter.com slash Mad for Miracle Max and it puts that username in the URL. So if you have a tool that, if you have a user name that would go into a URL like for Instagram or for GitHub, this tool may check it and it does it in your browser and we do not what collect it any of your data. So I just wanted to say, because you said something and I want to make technically sure about it. Did you, you said it, it uses your browser, but if I am using this tool, does it mean I, my, the traffic at my home is going to all these dodgy websites or is it, it's actually, I'm just connecting to your website and your website is doing all those connections. Nope. It, it's the, it's that your browser is making all of these requests. And that's why by default, we keep this as all excluding, not safe for work. So you're, if you just come here and you put in your favorite username or your username, it will not visit um, all of the not safe for work sites. It will visit a, a bunch of other different sites from your browser. Um, and that keeps it, it easy for us because we don't have to proxy 600 requests times X number of users. No, I'm glad you said that because it's, it's something that people need to be aware of because if they're at work, <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want that in the logs, right? Oh, absolutely. You don't want that network security person coming and knocking on your door saying, hey, why are you visiting all these sites? And you'd be like, yeah. I'm not, I'm just running this. Oh, yes. The nice thing about this tool, David, is that the output is made for open source intelligence people or cyber people. Um, here's all of the positive results that came back. And what we need to do is visit every single one of these and see if that person who has a profile at like BuzzFeed or let's say GitHub, or let's see, there's a key base in here. There's even some like the Twitter archived here. Let's see that one. So all I do is I open each one of these off and I look at the next profile and I see, Hey, is this my Mad for Miracle Max. Is there anything that ties this person to my target person? Could be the profile picture or the bio or something else. And in many cases, we there we see the profile picture again. So these might be related. In his biggest fan, we have an air, we have a a name of a of a city, but it's wrong. So that might be important. Here we have a, a link to his website. So what we do in OSINT is we will, oh, this one has a person's name, Gavin. Interesting. Um, the, the idea is that we find all the places where this person's Mad for Miracle Max name is, and then we gather it up and do some more queries. Like here we see a Twitter account, a GitHub account, we see a device. Um, and in some cases, we can even go back in time, like 
this one here, it looks like on archive.org, there's one hit. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because, I mean, you could run this against real people, right? And you, you, a lot of confidential or personal information can be found. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the, this this username enumeration is one of the ways that Griffin and I and OSINT people all over the world are finding people is that we run their usernames, we pull up other links to them, and then we follow those links. Um, in this case here in archive.org, we see an old tweet that Mad for Miracle Max made, and there's his picture as well. Um, and so we can take this data and then do other things with it. I'm always amazed when I talk to you guys and other people in OSINT how easy it seems. I mean, obviously you guys are experts and you've done lots of work to do it, but like how easy you could find like stuff that that's kind of like you wish was hidden. Well, and David, that's that's what we teach in our classes all the time. Yeah. We teach people how to bring order to the, the chaos of everything online. How do we find it and how do we look through it? And a lot of it's not the finding it, it's how do we look through it and how we figure out if this is relevant and related. Okay. And that's where tooling comes in so handy because you first get that kind of spark, that idea that, you know, hey, Mad for Miracle Max has a profile on this website. I wonder if they are Mad for Miracle Max in other places. And you could manually go out and do that research and maybe use search engines to be more efficient, right? But what if someone built a tool that would do all that searching mm -hmm. for you? And of course, Micah does that because that's what Micah does. Well, and the other thing is, honestly, how many times have you been like, I know I had an account on, I think, MySpace, but I forget what it was. And you enter in, you try to find your username. Yeah. Here, if you just put it in this tool, it'll find a lot of your accounts. And actually, that's the first thing that, that I tell people who are interested in finding their online personas and finding what they're, they're, what's online about them search for your usernames because in this tool at the bottom of the page it also runs a google search with your username with a username that you put in there and does some other things so it can really help find all of the, the places that your username is finding i even found somebody else that was using my web breacher username yeah it's very frustrating our second tool is going to be the Internet Archive. And Micah has shown how we've gotten a result there based off of pivoting from a username using the What's My Name tool, our first favorite tool. Now we're in the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine, archive.org. It goes by several different names. That's our second tool that we're going to show. And so you can see here that um, Micah showed a result for the Mad for Miracle Max Twitter account that was grabbed by the Wayback Machine. And if you look up in the left part of the screen there, you can see that it's grabbed that particular URL for that status. But let's talk about what the Wayback Machine does. The Wayback Machine is an archive of web pages, um, different types of software projects, books, and all kinds of other things. And from a research standpoint and open source intelligence, it's a potential goldmine of previously captured information about websites. And we use this all the time to explore things like um, the profiles that Micah mentioned, if those profiles are accessible to the crawler um, from the Wayback Machine. Uh, or, for example, if you do research into a company. Um, and so on the homepage here, you have the option to type in a URL or words related to a site's homepage, as it says, and it's going to go ahead and check their archive to see what they might have available for you. And I've completed a search here for a site called infosys.com, which is a major company with a long yeah. time web presence. And so if you were tasked with exploring the the web presence of this company, or maybe um, you know that that company has uh, changed uh, leadership over time, or maybe it's a personal website and, and you're hoping that they leaked contact information earlier on in the, in the cycle of the web page, something like that. You get this amazing calendar of all the years and all the times that they've captured those pages. So from a research standpoint, I could spend a lot of time going through these old captures, and this is obviously an example with a lot of content, and I could look for those uh, moments where maybe they, they had information on the page relevant to my investigation, or it was different than it is now, and that's useful for the question I'm trying to answer. Um, I love that they put it into a calendar like this so that you can get as granular as the day, look at multiple captures, and see how those things compare. Now, if we wanted to go back in time, for example, let's say 2001, I've got that pulled up here and you can look at captures that happen in that particular year. Maybe that's of interest to you because things have changed with the company around that time, or you're looking for information about a previous person who's associated with that company and clicking on one of these captures will actually take you to what the Wayback Machine grabbed at that exact date and time. And so this is an example of what the Infosys website looked like back then. And you may see different features on here from before, different information on, uh, on the site as before, like I mentioned. This is a really great and powerful tool just for this one specific use case. It's very powerful. 
and they also make it easy. So you can see this has 976 captures, which is quite a lot of data. They actually will give you, if you switch over to changes instead of that calendar view that we had the first time, you get a year-long archive color-coded of how different the site was each time they captured it. So they're measuring the difference, looking at that differential. So maybe you have tons and tons of content over the years on this site, and you really need those major changes. Maybe you're trying to prove that you know this company used to be branded as a different company, and they've completely rewritten their online image. Well, guess what? Maybe that happened you know round about this time here, where you see the darker color blue, massive changes to that website. So from an investigative standpoint, I'm very interested in what was happening around that time on their site. And we've That's used great. this in many cases to to look back at how things were, even a day, a week, a month ago. It doesn't scan the entire internet, but it does capture a huge number of sites on the internet. So um, there was a, a murder that was in, being investigated. I didn't investigate it or neither did Griffin, but there was a murder that was being investigated um, and the uh, potential murderer was on the church board and associated with this church and the church website stripped all of that off and was like, no, he's not a part of this. And you could literally go back one or two days and see, well, it used to look like this on your website. Now it looks like this. You definitely changed it. So really helpful for going back in time. So the third tool is going to be search by image. Now this is a plugin for your browser. And what it does is it takes an image that you want to search for, see where it was used, where else on the internet it's been, and it sends it automatically in your browser in other tabs to a whole bunch of different image recognition sites or image uh, reverse image search sites. And I'm gonna show you that here and then we'll, we'll take a look at the tool itself. So remember this from a, one of our other favorite tools. If we right click and open this image in a new tab, you see this is some kind of baseball stadium. Maybe you're interested in finding out what baseball stadium this is. And so you right click on it and you can send it to Google if you wanna search image with Google. What we're gonna do is search by image and then we're going to search all the search engines that I've configured it to do. So when I click this, what's gonna do is it's gonna open up five new tabs here and take that picture URL and send it off to Google and Bing and other ones. And here we see Google has already recognized that as Oriole Park at Camden Yards over in Baltimore, Maryland. And that's exactly where the picture was taken. The other places like Bing here, it doesn't actually find it. Uh, Yandex, which is a Russian search engine, does say Orioles wallpaper. So this is very similar to other things. This gets into how do we do things more efficiently? You absolutely could copy the URL to this image, right? Like that, copy that, and then open a tab and go to Google and put the URL in. Then open a tab and go to TinEye and Yandex and other places. But the reality is, is that if we can use this tool to send it to a whole bunch of different sites, that saves us a lot of time. And then we focus on the analysis. So here, this is Shutterstock, the stock photo site. And you can see that this looks very similar to this, right? And so if we go back here, um, you can see this is the right field line at Cab Camden Yards if we click there. Um, one of the best things that I've used this for in cases is something that I always encourage people to do when they're getting a new tool. Check the settings. What can you do with this thing? Um, for instance, if we come over here to this little red camera, that's what it looks like when you put it into your Chrome or your Firefox, even Edge and Opera. You'll see this little red camera, go to there, options, and look at this. We have over 40 different websites that it will send data to. So when I'm looking up some picture of a canal over in Asia, I'm going to probably turn on like Baidu and Sogu and some of these Asian-focused search engines that have that type of imagery. Um, if I'm looking for more a brand, a picture of, a, of a, something on somebody's shirt, a logo or something, I might enable some Getty and iStock and Adobe Stock photos or... I can even go down to like the global brand database, trademark view, Australian trademark search, because people submit logos like this to those places. And we can search that using this tool for free. So that tool, is it, can you just mention the tool? How do I get it? Uh, Absolutely. Is it so this tool is search by image and search by image is available. As you can see on this GitHub page, you can get it from the Chrome store, uh, Firefox store or whatever. So you just, in your browser, you just click, and we visit the Chrome Web Store. And then in here, or in Firefox Store, we just type search 
by image. And then we look for that camera right here by Armin Dev. Um, and that's what we would install. So very simple, easy, works with whatever browser you're using for OSINT and free. Did you, you prefer Firefox, right? I prefer Firefox, but I use Chrome a lot more than Firefox for open source intelligence. And there's, there's a really good reason for that is a lot of the really cool tools, like one of the ones we're going to show you in just a little bit, only works in Chrome. So I can't use Firefox. So I'll use Firefox. I'll have Firefox up and running. I'll do my, my research queries and stuff, but all my OSINT I'm doing in Chrome or a Chromium-based browser. You're basically geolocating an image, right? Is that, is that what you're doing there? Well, we're finding that associated data for the image. It might be a geolocation. It might be who owns it. It might be um, other things associated with it where I can buy that product. Uh, Griffin had a, a case that he worked on where he w had a picture and it had a whole bunch of different uh, products in it, household products like cleaners and other stuff. And we use reverse image searching to find out what stores sell that product and then we can, based upon that, maybe identify what area of the world that that picture was taken in or um, where somebody shops, because that might be important also to a case. Yeah, I used the search by image tool recently for an investigation where we had a, a missing child. And um, through some social media research, I came across a series of photos that depicted people that were on a sports team together. And I was trying to localize that sports team to figure out where they were and, and see if that was going to be a friend network of the person that I was looking for a social media presence of. And using the search by image tool, I was able to um, quickly search a number of different uh, services for that the image that I had, but crop it down to the logo on the team shirts and be able to identify the, the team and then subsequently the location and the town that they're from, which helped me in social media research to connect those dots between the, the people in the photos and the person that I'm looking for. Uh, and obviously other things helped you find the, the missing person, right? Exactly. Yep. Those, those types of tools can help to when, when you're investigating a missing person, a lot of times finding their presence online can yield helpful information, whether it be active online presence that maybe people don't know about, um, additional accounts maybe under, under alias names and things like that, or associated persons or locations that might help you um, maybe catch up to where that person is, depending on the circumstances of their disappearance. And all of those things can be enabled by doing reverse image searching. And really the search by image tool creates that efficiency that we talked out of, about at the beginning where, where you have to perform a task like reverse and image searching, but you need to do it repeatedly over lots of services. Search by image does that at the push of a button. All right, ready for number four? Yeah, that's great. This is brilliant. All right. So the fourth tool that we're going to uh, tell you about that can help in your OSINT is a little bit different. It's not one that's going to go out there and get information, but it is absolutely one that's going to help you organize the information that you have to collect. Open source intelligence, the, the flashy tools are the ones that go out and grab data and organize it and sort it and show it to you. This one is one that's going to help you take notes. Um, it's one I feel very passionately about. It's called Obsidian. And you can get it for free at obsidian.md. Uh, Obsidian is essentially a tool that allows you to take notes on your computer. It saves everything in text files or image files or PDFs, whatever it is that you're putting in there. And it allows you to sh see connections in that stuff. It's kind of like multi, it's got Multigo functions. It's got uh, kind of Visio functions, but it also has word functions and other things. And it's all in, in this one tool. I could take literally two hours to go through this tool because I've done that. I, I have a video of myself going uh, uh, showing how to use this tool. Now, I've also created some resources out there, some free OSINT templates that, that people can download, and we'll show, share those links with you. But essentially, you have text documents. All of these things over here are text documents, and then you can edit them, hyperlink them, all using a technology called Markdown. The great thing about this for using with OSINT is something that we can see right up here in the example case. Many times what we have is we'll have a primary person that we're researching and that person will have a car associated with them or we'll work at a certain job or we'll have other people they're associated with. And trying to keep track of all of that in just Notepad or WordPad or, or even like VS Codium or something like that or Word, it's, it's linear, it's sequential and it doesn't represent those relationships really well. Obsidian definitely does that because what we can do is have a page for Alistair Kemp, this made up guy I, I created. And then we can say, Hey, this person is linked to Gabriella Parkington who has her own page. 
So as you start creating these other entities, we create another note for them. And those other notes then contain data just about that person. Now, once I was doing, when I was doing uh, hacking website attacks and stuff, this would have been incredible because, you know, you scan an entire subnet and then you find certain hosts. Those hosts have uh, certain vulnerabilities, certain opportunities to attack them or to test them. Here, we can actually separate each one of those into their own note, then note the exact things that were wrong, how we went ahead and exploited them, and how the customer can fix it. So this is a general note-taking tool that has some really cool built-in features. For instance, since I've linked uh, Gabriella Parkington and Alistair Kemp together by by, and by this uh, method right here, just showing their, their notes are connected, I can come to the built-in graph view and we can see that these notes are touching somehow. Now we can do this in other ways too. Think about this. You are looking at a subnet of computers and you've noted on each one of them that they're hosted in a certain place or owned by a certain person or all are, are tagged to the certain uh, dark web onion address. Well, those types of, of patterns and connections come out in this tool. Really, really interesting. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I use this every single day for taking notes for meetings, for connecting ideas and thoughts within my daily tasks, and to frustrate Griffin because he doesn't like using it that much. Obsidian has so many advanced features and plugins available um, that it really can be a little bit overwhelming on the surface. And Micah does have um, both a free and paid course um, regarding how to use Obsidian or getting started with using Obsidian. But you can kind of customize it to your heart's intent. I do use Obsidian in my in my stuff as well. You know, when it comes to investigative research, you have to have a professional way to collect and organize your notes if you plan to do professional OSINT work. That's just the bottom line. And this is a free tool with many professional features that anybody can access. So that's why we like to recommend it. One of the things that I constantly hear is I would love to be able to have my standard operating procedures for what I do or what my team does uh, when I have an email address or a phone number. You know, there's, there's a process that we generally go through to find out where it's being used, who owns it. I would love, and people tell me, I would love to have that closer to where I'm recording my stuff. With the way that I built this free OSINT vault, um, for Obsidian, you have that right here. So we have the standard operating procedures here that says, hey, for a uh, person's name, make sure to go and search for it in a person's search in the people search engines. Use that's them and true people search. And so when we create these these things, we can say, hey, make sure to do these 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 things by going to this part of our standard operating procedure. So imagine that we have three people that are working on a case whether it's investigating a domain or a person or a business, they're all working from the same standard operating procedures that is a live document inside of your vault. It's really powerful for standardizing content too. Okay, but hold on a minute. So there's Obsidian, that's a, that the tool that you would use, but you've created this vault thing, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so what it is, is Obsidian saves all of the files that are associated with whatever you're doing into what they call a vault. And a vault is just a folder or a directory on your computer. I've chosen to take that vault, which has all of the settings for this, all of the plugins and extensions, and has all of this content. And I've zipped it up and put it onto a GitHub repository that's on my github.com slash webreacher and it is the Obsidian OSINT vault templates. And I'll give you that link. People can download that vault, uncompress it, and then just point Obsidian at it, and it will go ahead and open that up, and they'll be able to use this sample vault. Yeah, because the problem I'm seeing is, okay, uh, you've shown us a few tools already. It's like, okay, how do I even start? And I mean, yeah. that's great, right? Because you've given us kind of like a, a roadmap or a path, like do this, do this, do this, do this, right? Yeah, uh, and, and that's the thing is that these are our favorite tools. Um, when we came on, we told you it was our favorite tools. And, and, and some of these favorite tools are used in certain places and not in others. With like Obsidian, I'm, I use it literally every single day for OSINT, for other things. And, and some of these tools are really easy to use, like search by image. You pop it in your browser and you're going. Obsidian, I will warn you, does take a little bit of time to, to actually like get into and learn. There's a learning curve there. Um, and this is my uh, WebReacher GitHub. There's Obsidian OSINT templates right here. And if you come here, it tells you all about uh, how to use this, 
what to do. I've even got a blog post, a YouTube video, and other stuff to help people get into this. And as Griffin mentioned, um, Myosin Training has an Obsidian course that's pretty darn popular that teaches people uh, Obsidian for OSIN. So the, the YouTube video is free, and then that's a paid course. Is, there, is, is that you got correct? It. YouTube video is free, paid, paid course down here. Yeah, I, I think it's it's important to differentiate this just for everyone who's watching. I, I love it that Micah and Griffin have given us like the free stuff to get started with. Um, and it's, you know, if you're a student or you're just interested, you don't necessarily have the money, but then you're also giving us like the professional version. Don't be shy to like recommend like professional tools. The one I'm thinking about is um, Justin's Hunch, Hunchly, is it? Hunchly, Hunchly, yeah. Yeah, is that is that kind of the same thing or is that more, right? Yeah, it, it's a paid tool and it, it does a lot of really good things. I think I would more uh, reference it to like Burp Suite Pro and Burp Suite uh, with, they have a free community edition. You get hooked on the community edition and then you see all the power in the pro and you're like, all right, one day I'm going to have my employer buy that for me. And then you get the license and now your capabilities have skyrocketed. Same thing with these things. Griffin's going to be talking about a tool, some tools later on that have right. a free version, but then if you pay them, you get even more. So yeah. Yep. And that's a great way to approach learning about these different tools. And it you get a chance to experience the use of it, see the capabilities of it, understand how it's going to enhance your work and your capabilities. And then you or your employer, you know, the people you work with can make that buying decision about do we upgrade this? Do we go to a, a paid tool? The reality is, they, you know, in these types of environments, the folks that are making the bigger and better capability tools and adding in data repositories and doing all these cool uh, features and enhancements all the time, that costs money. So they have to charge for their products eventually, right? Our number five tool here is urlscan.io. And we could probably do an entire video about all the capabilities of urlscan.io. We're going to keep this focused on OSINT practitioners, okay? There's lots of capabilities beyond just what you could gather from an OSINT perspective. But this is a site here where um, people can have uh, a domain scan, a website scan, and look at all kinds of different functions and features and technologies and things related to it. So let me tell you about kind of how I use this. Uh, there's lots of times in my investigative work where I come across the URL. Maybe it's part of the evidence in a case. Maybe it's, you know, the initial contact between a scammer and a person that they're trying to extort. Uh, or maybe it's uh, it's left over in an archive of something that we've scraped that we're trying to use to investigate a, a person who's gone missing or something like that. I never go and visit a website just right out of the gate by clicking on the <laughs> link or typing yeah, it in. Yeah, exactly. To it. Never. I just never do that, right? And I've got to have ways to go and sort of remotely visit that site ahead of time so that I can get a sense of, is this going to be okay? I have lots of tools that do different versions of just that type of thing, but urlscan.io offers some really complete capability. If my investigation led me to a, to a URL that was myosint.llc, and I was curious about that site, I needed to go there and visit it, but I don't want to actually touch it. I can use this site to go visit it. Now, before I perform this search, I want to stop and give everybody a warning, okay? What I'm doing on here right now is publicly viewable. Everybody's going to be able to see that I scanned myosin.llc. So if you don't want that to happen, this is what you need to do. When you have what you're going to search here, you have some options. You can see it's defaulted to private scan. Or, or sorry, I have it set on private scan right now. If you click on options, it defaults actually to the public scan. I recommend that you change it over to private if you need to so that other people can't see it. Now there's other configurations here that you can play with. You can change the user agent and so on, but we're gonna stick to the very simple basic use of this. I wanna know about myosin.llc and I kinda wanna look privately and I'm gonna solve a captcha here because what's better than solving captchas on a live demo? All right, so I've performed the search and it's taken me to this. Now, if you look, I'm not on myosin.llc. It's actually detected that there is a redirect sequence here where I've submitted the URL myosin.llc and the effective URL, the place I ended up is myosin.training. So this is another safeguard feature that I'm using a URL scan for, and that is to make sure that I'm not being redirected to someplace malicious. Down here, you can actually see the page URL history of the hops and where you're going. Um, and I get this helpful screenshot right here. I can click on it and it's going to give me a, a full page screenshot to look at what's right there on the home page, right what they right what they've captured. And I can see that here in the browser without having visited that myself. Now this might be enough information for me to know that I can proceed to that site safely. Uh, you know, maybe I have to do additional research to look at what technologies are running or what scripts are running on the page. And and that goes beyond the scope of really what I want to talk about here. But um I've now detected 
that I'm being redirected. And I've been able to put my eyes on that front page of the site so that I can see sort of what the content is, right? Now, there's a few other useful features here. You can see that this particular site has been scanned nine times on URL scan.io. Now, similar to how when we looked at the Wayback Machine as one of our earlier tools, you were able to see previous captures. It might be useful for you in your investigation to see those previous captures on URL scan of this particular um, URL, right? Um, and you can do that. You can search that. If you go to this search icon here at the top of the page and perform a search for myosin.training, you'll actually get a list of all of these different times that myosin.training has been captured. But if you notice here, it's also capturing subdomains, okay? yoga.myosin.training, right? So this can also help you expand your research into the subdomains of a particular site, um, maybe see things that you didn't already know about, right? That could have been hidden information, see how far back people were looking at it and look at those changes over time. Really from an OSINT perspective, just these very basic features of URL scan.io are super helpful to someone like you. So uh, for an OSINT perspective, many times what we need to do is actually analyze a web page, like break it down. What's running this? Where is it running? This in a single query has given us all of that. You see over here, we've got IP addresses. We've got Cloudflare, Amazon, Google. You can see where the parts of this website are being hosted. And if you need to send subpoenas, if you're law enforcement or you just need to understand is this going to be inside or outside of my scope for uh, some type of penetration test or security testing? You've got a lot of that right here. And it hasn't been done from your computer. The URL scan.io system has reached out to this. Plus, on the right hand side, you see detected technologies. So if you know that, hey, you, you're going to be working on mixed panel and jQuery and reCAPTCHA, you can create, you can uh, gather those tools so that you can do your assessment even faster. I mean, it's also great that you, you don't go to some dodgy website and get like malware or something installed, stuff like that. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yep. And in fact, one of the things that this will do is um, farther up, uh, this site absolutely has no malware because it's our site, but uh, it will actually- Oh, it's your site. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it'll run the, the URL through things like Google and other places that have that block list of, hey, this is a known malicious site or a known malware hosting site. And it'll flag it right there in that page and let you know this is phishing or something else like that. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, Micah, you guys are way too humble, right? And you create all these crazy tools. Well, we I would love to, to claim that I created this stuff, but um, these tools are, are just uh, ones that we've collected. And our number six tool is another one focused on website and infrastructure, and that's going to be dnsdumpster.com. DNS Dumpster uh, is a site that's going to go out there and check the structure of a site, grab all those interesting nuggets that we want, and give it back to you in a very readable form. So I'm going to look at a site here called madformiraclemax.com. If you remember earlier in the video, we looked at the username Miracle, Mad for Miracle Max. We've maybe discovered that person has a website and we want to take a look at what's going on in that particular site. We run that query for Mad for Miracle Max. We get some information here about maybe the hosting locations, right? Could be indicative of where they're coming from in the world. Degree, you can see their DNS servers. You can also see things like their MX records. Are they running email services through that website? And who is the company that provides those services? But the most interesting part a lot of times is right here in the text records. Now, if you're going to look at mad4miraclemax.com, you're going to find some interesting text records. Right, this first one here, reach out to Maxwell at madformiraclemax.com if problems. Sometimes you might find people leaking information, contact information, email information, things like that. This here looks like some Base64 encoded text. Yeah, Maybe you have a Base64 decoder, you could run that and find out if there's a message there for you. Lots of different things here you can find and validate that maybe they had services running on those sites that required a text record at some point. You can see Apple domain verification, Google verification, and so on. And that can help you understand the capabilities and technologies. I like this kind of thing because when um, I'm investigating a more organized network that may have multiple websites set up to run maybe uh, phishing campaigns or other things, a lot of times they're using common technologies across those different sites and you can detect that, okay, there's a lot of similarity between the stack that goes into this website and this website and this website. And really it's starting to look like it's all the same kind of network. 
also from a cyber perspective, uh, we know a lot of you out there are probably either coming from cyber or currently in cyber. This is one of those one-stop tools where you do one thing, the tool does a whole bunch of things faster than you can. For instance, if, if we wanted to do DNS lookups, we could do that. There are special tools that allow us to do that. We could do command line tools or online tools. If we wanted to do DNS enumeration or passive DNS checks, we can do that as well. But this tool with a single entry does all that for us for free. And it's so quick. I mean, this is an example from a, a domain called PaneraBread.com. It's a restaurant chain over here in the United States. Just to give you an example of what a, a professional company and not a capture the flag endpoint might look like. Here we've got the DNS servers. We've got some mail records there that tell you where they are getting their mail. You can see that on the right-hand side, Ironport system. So this company uses Ironport. If you're a penetration tester or you are somebody that is doing reconnaissance or, or OSINT on a certain domain, and you can understand that the mail, the MX records for that company are being sent to, or that mail is being sent to Ironport systems, then you know that you're going to have to avoid iron ports filtering, mail filtering, if you have to send a fake phishing email to test their systems or something. But Griffin mentioned the text records. If you scroll down here, we see that Panera is connected to Google. That's no, that's a no brainer, but they also have Facebook, Atlassian, who makes uh, Confluence, Jira. We even have some other things in here, like there's a Dropbox domain verification. So just with this information here, the text records. It's crazy we start to put together a picture of what external services this company may be using. I say may be using because this could be really old or it could be for future stuff. But David, the really cool stuff, some companies make their A records, their IP and host names really verbose. So if we scroll down a bunch further, so here we start seeing some of these really interesting host names on the left, FTP2, any connect to. David, I bet you know what AnyConnect is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So if I was trying to target this company's external interfaces and I needed to know where their company VPN endpoint is, there I have a host named AnyConnect2, and it's on AT&T's network. So in just one query of PaneraBread.com, I get all of this data for free. It's an incredibly powerful tool that saves me so much time. And that's what I love about you guys doing these videos. It's people aren't always aware, companies aren't always aware of how much is available out there and how much is leaked. I love that these tools expose not only the technical pieces of information, but also for me anyway, they spark that sort of creative curiosity where I think, hey, wait a minute, how can I connect that to this other piece of data? Or what might that lead me to? Or what pattern is that showing me if I look hard enough? And that's really the the power of open source intelligence is this data is all out there and it means different things to different people. To an investigator, yeah. it might mean something totally different than a person who's very um, technical and looking for a different you know use case. And not only that, going from cyber to OSINT, it pushed me from command line and, and scripts all the way up into the browser. And so, you know, at first I was like, no, I'm going to continue running my greps with a really amazing, you know, uh, pipe string. But the more I'm, I'm recognizing that these tools are available, the more I see the value in them. I, I mean, you absolutely could run some kind of script or some kind of tool on the command line to dig these different subdomains and domains and then grab those and recursively check them out. But this tool does it for you in your web browser. And it's so much easier to just offload that. Mike, you're going to be in trouble now with like the most of the audience because, you know, if you don't use CLI, you like a reject, right? Yeah, you know, when I first started doing uh, open source <laughs> intelligence, I, I injected a lot of command line stuff, greps, cuts, seds, aux into my my course. <laughs> and I, I recognized that when I had moved away from cyber students and cyber uh, people, uh, the law enforcement started coming in, uh, normal people that are not cyber came in, and they're looking at these greps and seds and aux and cuts and and they, it was just horrendous. So I embraced the browser-based tools and I love CLI as well. I mean, it's exactly. like use the best tool for you for what the job, right? So use what makes yeah. you most efficient. Oh, absolutely. And there are some Python tools that do an incredible like across the board job. Uh, it's just, it's much easier to just pop open a browser, type and fill in a field than remembering Python 3 dash host equals, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, and the easier. output is often a lot more, um, more digestible and presentable. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next tool. 
This is tool number seven. Tool number seven is a browser plugin. And earlier I mentioned that I use Chrome and Chromium based browsers for more of my OSINT work because there's some tools that are amazing and they only work in Chrome or Chromium based tools. Instant Data Scraper is one of those. Instant Data Scraper, you can literally go to the Chrome web store as I've done here and install it in your Chrome, Chromium, Brave, Microsoft Edge browsers that are all Chromium based. And what this tool does is just makes, again, makes life really easy. And I'm gonna use uh, your video for an example here, David. One of the things that we commonly have to do is, is scrape contacts or, or scrape friends list or activity or feeds. Um, and to do that, I mean, it's, it's incredibly painful to scroll down, take a screenshot or copy this with my mouse and then scroll down more and do that. So what I can do is I can scroll down a page and just do, just grab and have my, my browser load a whole bunch of the comments and then hitting this little, it looks like a pokeball to me. I don't know how they're getting away with this, with the copyright things. If I hit the pokeball, the tool is in my Google Chrome and it's now checking the HTML on the page looking for tables. It's pulled a table here. Um, and what it will do is it'll pull tables. I'm gonna try another table. You can see this, it's found this table here. So if I wanted to download all of those next set of videos, I could do that. I'm gonna have it do another one. Let's see. Oh, and these are the comments now. So each one of these is a row in the table. And it looks like I've got all of the different things from who made the comment to what the comment was. <laughs> you are right. Yeah. And then David, we just download it to XLS. And when we do that, we come over here and here's all the comments for free. Wow. Yeah. Plus the tool has an amazing ability to scroll down the page automatically. So we can, for those longer pages that are on like Twitter or YouTube, or whatever, it'll scroll down, recognize more things it needs to download. It'll download those and scroll down and do that again and again and again. It can even hit the next button to go to the next page of search results. Really cool. David, I'd like to say that our next tool, number eight, is a new tool that I'd like to introduce to you. But the reality is we've been using it this entire time. It is Chasm. Yeah, you knew it, right? I was gonna ask you about them, so that's great. Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, many of you uh, that are in cybersecurity recognize that we use virtual machines for a lot of stuff, right? We we have a, our hacking machine, and then we also have our, our virtual machine that maybe is our target, and, and we have uh, them separated and we can set them to be reverted so that we can do whatever we want and then it reverts back to a known good state and that's all on your system. With OSINT, that works a good amount of time and there are some really good OSINT VMs, but what I'm finding is having that overhead of buying and running a virtual machine software or just mm -hmm. using free ones like VirtualBox, it can be expensive both in the resources on your system and in the funds that it costs for a VMware or something like that. What about leakage? You know, that's another problem people always worry about. Like if you download some trash on that VM, it might get into your actual system. Yeah, the absolutely. VM might not be isolated like you think it is. Yeah, sorry, go on. Having that isolation is really important. And I was just going to say that in the OSINT world, having that isolation from me, my computer, my browser, my yeah. IP address, really, really useful. And so this entire time, whenever I've been giving a demo, I've actually been using the Chasm workspace to do that. And so this is inside of a browser. You can see up here, I have my OSINT trainings. This is my Chasm uh, interface. And I'm running an Ubuntu Linux desktop computer in my browser. And so I can do, I've done all of the demos. I'm running a uh, spreadsheet here. I can use all of the, the features of this, upload and download files, and it's all doable. And then when I log out, I can, since I have the paid version here, I can set it to either, actually, when I log out, it may keep my changes or it might not, depending on how I started this. I started this to maintain all my changes, that persistent mode, um, and it's really, really helpful in my investigations. It's like a Docker container or something, right? It is. Yeah, it's a set of Docker containers. And the workspace, the cool thing is that we can go ahead and go to other workspaces. So while that Ubuntu desktop is running right now, it's it's running and doing whatever it is. It could be uh, running some scripts for me or just paused right now. I can go ahead and launch a persistent or non-persistent Google Chrome browser. 
And this is being launched on Chasm servers. And here I have a Chrome browser. So I can surf whatever I want. I can go to whatever site I want. The IP address that I'm using is Chasm server. This browser, if it gets infected with malware, when I delete the session and trash it, none of that comes back to my computer at all. It just deletes it. Um, it keeps me safe allows me to not use my home IP address or my work IP address for my work. And it allows me to do a whole bunch of stuff in my browser. So if I just had an iPad or a, a mobile device, I still can do things remotely. And one thing I noticed is, are you and Griffin using the same device or how are you doing like, cause you're flipping from one to the other, it looks like. So uh, we actually were going to try to do that, David, where we can share a workspace, but we didn't work it out in time. So we actually have- No, that's worse. Yeah. This kind of thing is becoming really important because it's like when you get an email or something, I mean, you get paid solutions, but you just want to be able to click on something like this where it's totally isolated. So if it does get infected, you don't, you know, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't affect your computer. So I think this is fantastic. It's, it's really interesting to see you guys using it with OSINT. Yeah. And, and you know, David, there, there's that maliciousness, but there's also just suspicious sites out there. You never know what you're going to get when you go to certain sites. So being able to come over here at, to, to our Chasm instance and just do whatever it is that we want without having that fear of, oh, it might infect my company's computer or whatever, really, really useful. Um, and I should mention that Chasm has both paid and free system. So if you have no budget and you want to try it out, go over to Chasm Web and go to Cloud Personal. And then down here, it tells you all about it and all about the features and stuff that are involved with it. You can just sign up for the free version. The free version does not have some of the features I showed, like the persistence and other stuff, yeah. but it is free and it gives you that virtual browser in the cloud. Uh, one of the ways that I We'll use instant data scraper is when I have a, a great deal of results um, and things that I want to capture and analyze. So this is an old blog that I wrote about a, a series of fictitious profiles on LinkedIn that I determined to be connected based on the context of what they placed on each of those profiles. So um, I noticed that I was being targeted by a number of fake profiles that had, you know, GAN generated imagery, the, the generated adversarial network photos of fake people. But as I examined the profiles, I noticed the consistency in things like the biography language and, and other text-based things. And I thought, I wonder if Google has scraped those results in a way that if I run queries using Google dorking to kind of isolate those particular profiles in the Google results, then I could scrape it. And what I found was running sections of those bios that they were constantly repeating on this whole farm of fake profiles was just giving me hundreds and hundreds of results. And it allowed me to do things like create graphs of the different types of profiles so I could see what the proposed backgrounds were of these people that were trying to do fake recruiting and, and things like that. So just a lot of utility in that tool. And it's all about the creativity and how you want to use it. There are loads of different ways that you can approach open source intelligence research. In some cases, you might be looking at a company business entity or a person connected to a company and things like that. And Open Corporates is, is one of those repositories that allows you kind of that, that peek behind the curtain with who is involved in a company, maybe where they're physically located. It also helps you make those connections between maybe businesses in other parts of the world um, or other parts of the country and other associations between the officers and people. And when you land on this page, it gives you the option right off the bat to search their 222 million companies. That's a lot of results, right? You can also search officers by switching over the search right here, 311 million officers. So they have a massive data repository um, of stuff that you can search. Those officers are the people that run the companies, not like law enforcement officers, just to throw that out there. Exactly. The, the people associated with the company. So if I'm going to look for an officer, for example, Elon Musk, and you can filter it by different jurisdictions if you really need to narrow it to a country, you're going to get a results page that looks like this. And these are all the corporate um, entities that they've found Elon Musk to be connected with as a company. When you switch over to officers, you can run it as an officer search. And so you kind of get that, that either or look at the data and how they capture it. You can see in the name of the company, they have Elon Musk and Associates. But maybe you're interested in the people in the company specifically because maybe Elon Musk is associated with Intelligence Artificial Limited and that doesn't have his name in it. And you can open each of these and see further details. For example, um, when I look at Elon Musk as a person, I get all of these different roles that someone named Elon Musk is associated with. So chairman, chairman of the board, president, things like that. Maybe I'm interested in the company Space Exploration and I open that 
and I can see here information about the company, when it was incorporated, what type of business it is, maybe a registered address. Do they have an agent? Down here is where it gets interesting from an OSINT perspective for me. Who are the directors and officers associated with that business? Who are the people that are in the circle of maybe the person that I'm interested in looking at or the business that I'm interested in looking at that can help me pivot out to other companies? You know, when you think about the amazing research done by some uh, investigative journalists into uh, folks that are trying yeah. to hide assets or, you know, things like that around yeah. the world. How, how do you spider web that whole network? Well, one way that you can do it is examine their business holdings, examine the companies that people are associated with, find those personal business associations, and then spider web out into that network. And here you get a list of all kinds of different directors and officers. One thing that I really like this site for, and this is a, a feature that requires you to be logged in as a user. It's not a paid feature or anything like that. It's still free, but you do have to be logged in, is that they'll direct you to the registry page of where the data comes from. Now, this is really important for me because a lot of times I want to see that original documentation and lots of states and countries and provinces around the world will scan and upload that information to their local database. You know, in the United States, it might be a, a Secretary of State website. And I can actually yeah. physically examine the documents that were submitted to the state to incorporate this particular business. Those documents are going to have things for me like email addresses, names, phone numbers, addresses, and other things perhaps don't appear in these records or have been changed or obfuscated over time. But that original piece of paper might have the one nugget that I need. It's, a, it's both amazing and scary at the same time to see how much information is out there. Open Corporates, for those of you that are programmatically inclined, has API key that you can register for, and you can do a lot of this work of looking up people, looking up businesses, and getting those references and those connections uh, via Python or some other tool as well. So really, really helpful to at quickly being able to suss out who's associated with what organization and what other places. Did you find programming helped you a lot? Micah, because it seems like you create a lot of your own tools or integrate with a lot of other tools. I think programming allows me to do things faster and at more at scale. Although nowadays with ChatGPT doing what it's doing, it's making it much, much easier to do that complex programming of analyzing huge amounts of data very quickly or grabbing a lot of data. And that's really is why we've picked up some of these tools is that these tools like Instant Data Scraper allows us to, in our browser, grab all this content, whereas I would normally have to write a Python script using uh, requests or using you know, uh, some other things like Beautiful Soup or something to scrape out that content, parse it, then export it to a CSV. Don't need to do any of that anymore because it's all pushed up to these cool tools. So, I mean, is ChatGPT one of your tools or is that like an extra prep? That we're saving for another video with you. No, that's great. I'd look forward to that because it's like, I can imagine if you dump data into ChatGPT, you can just ask it questions about the data and it does all that hard work, right? Oh, absolutely. That plus image creation, uh, image analysis, uh, some of the tools nowadays are really, really cool because you can throw an image into a ChatGPT if it's a non-sensitive image and ChatGPT or some of these other AI tools will tell you exactly where that the city that it was taken in or other places about the image. So that's some some stuff for a future video. So for everyone who's watching, do you want Mike and Griffin to come back with AI for OSEN? I think that'll be a good video. All right. So our last tool is um, a bit of a twofer, right? So we're going to we're gonna include a second um, option here at the end, but the Epios tool, epios.com is an amazing tool. It was kind of first to market in this in this little niche that's now grown and become actually very competitive in terms of options and, and paid tools versus free. But what Epios originally did was took an email address and looked for the presence of a Google account associated with it. Why is that important? Well, in open source intelligence, finding things like a person's Google account, if you're a law enforcement officer, uh, allows you to do things like get all kinds of information via legal process from that company. The connected Google account if you're an open source practitioner and you don't have access to that legal process, can give you things like their profile photo that you could reverse search or glean information from or connect back to social media accounts, their Google reviews that they've left for businesses while they've been logged into Google. So that time they hated that Chinese food that they got from that restaurant might help you narrow down the area that they live. So there's, there's pivotable information there. Now the tool has expanded and grown and I'm gonna show some more of what it does now. Um, but originally it was checking for those associated Google accounts. 
here on the homepage, you can see that you have the option to search by email and search by phone, which phone is going to be a paid feature of this service. Email is going to be free. And we do recommend that you set up a free login account on Epios. While it doesn't cost any money to perform the basic queries, if you are logged in, they will give you more unredacted information than what you would get if you were logged or were not logged in. If you're not logged in, they do blur some of the results out. Um, but you can here search for ex uh, example, john at gmail.com, you know, just kind of an innocuous email address that's going to have a lot of results. And as you can see, they're giving the option right off the bat to download the data, which I really like. That's a new feature. So you can grab that and work with it offline. Um, get it for your reporting. But it starts out now with hitting Have I Been Pwned? And Have I Been Pwned is that breach checker website that's going to give us, you know, hey, have we seen this email presence in breach data, right? That can help with your validation um, and things like that. As you go farther down, though, they're going to check other services for the pres presence of that email address in use. Now, this can be very useful um, in finding social profiles, uh, in making connections and things. Uh, here, they're, they're checking uh, Vivino, Flickr, and you've got the Google account. Now I mentioned before that there can be a profile photo, right? So this person doesn't have a profile photo set up on here, but if they have one, you can see that and open it via this link and get a look at their full profile photo on their Google account. And one thing that I didn't mention before is that you can have a Google account without having a Gmail address. So I run every single email address that I'm researching through the Epios email tool, because you never know when someone's Hotmail or Outlook or or company email or school email is going to be connected to a Google account that's going to give you more information you can work off of. You get the user-generated content about what their name is. That can be interesting. And this is where you've got those Google Maps where you can look at their linked reviews, right? Maybe they've left a business review and so on. Really valuable information here. There's other services checked, Trello, Skype, and some others, Gravatar. So this tool is really built out over the years, and that build-out has created some... Um, competitiveness in the space. Uh, one tool that we aren't demoing because it is a fully paid tool now is OSINT.Industries. And OSINT Industries is a competitor now to Epios that has really been innovative with the addition of features and more modules and more search capabilities, but it is a paid service. If you do this kind of work all the time, I would definitely recommend that you look into the paid tier of Epios and the option of OSINT.Industries as a paid competitive option and figure out what tool is going to work for you. One of my favorite things to do whenever I get a connected Google account to someone's email is take a look at this Google Maps link. Now, what that's going to do is drop me in Google Maps and show me any business review that that Google profile has left while that user's been logged in. And that can help me to localize a person. Maybe I'm trying to find their physical location, or maybe I have a list of addresses and I'm not sure what part of the world they live in now or what part of a country. But one time... One time, actually, um, not that long ago, I had an investigation on a fugitive, and this fugitive was was taken off from a case where they had been um, charged and indicted, and they were on the run, and we needed to find out where she was. And as I combed through all the data that we had from the investigation, and I was looking at all the options that I could explore with different things, one piece of data stood out to me, and that was an email address. And I thought, I wonder if that service is being used, because I thought maybe we could follow up with Google or some other data provider but what I got was a surprise because this user had left a Google review for an apartment complex in a particular part of the country saying, I just rented an apartment from XYZ apartment complex. And so-and-so at the front counter, the manager was the most helpful person and left a glowing review of this business that, oh, the wow. that the sheriff's visited, you know, 24 hours later, knocking on the door to take her back into custody. So you're, you're always looking for those slip ups and sometimes they're really big slip ups like these, but people who, you know, are using these services and the stuff that we all kind of just uh, take for granted and don't think about privacy in regards to are leaking that information in a way that can help you as an investigator, connect the dots, track them down, you know, find things like that. Yeah. I look at this from two perspectives, right? It's, um, it's great that you're able to use this. And on the flip side, if I want privacy, I shouldn't use a Google account. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything that you do online is potentially connected. And it doesn't matter if yeah. there's a physical connection between things. Sometimes it's that contextual connection with your profile photo or the text-based connection with your username and all the stuff that we've sort of jumped through in these in these tool videos. All of those dots can connect together in different ways. And that's where you're the investigator having the the capability that's enhanced by these tools, but bringing their own creative mindset and their own curiosity is really going to be powerful and effective.
No, I think one of the things that I most loved about getting into the ocean space was that it helped me figure out that, that I wasn't as private as I thought I was online. Yeah. And it helped me to find all those places where my extra data, my username, my email, my my old MySpace account, whatever was out there. And I could then identify that once I had it identified, I could remove that from the internet. Now, there are always copies of things and all, but uh, in general, it, it it really helped me increase a little bit of that privacy and reclaim some of those things that we just give away. Any tools that you recommend for like removing or getting rid of your data out there? So there are some tools out there that can do this. I think the best one that I can recommend is a PDF by Michael Bazell on IntelTechniques.com. This is, it, it's not automated. There are companies out there that say that they will automate this. I have no experience with that, but I can tell you I had an intern a couple summers ago work for me and their job was to visit all of these different websites that pull your data out of it. And they had a huge amount of problems because some websites that had my phone number and my email, they wanted a picture of my driver's license so that they could verify that I was actually me. And there's no way I'm going to yeah. give them more data to remove that exactly. little data. So so I'm. It's, it's challenging. And some sites won't remove, if a third party asks to remove your data, they won't even deal with them, especially over here in the United States. Right. But Griffin, what is this document? Yeah, so um, Michael Bazell of OSINT fame and privacy fame and so on um, created a digital guide for you to do self-removal of your online data. And there are services that you can pay that will go do this um, work for you if, if you need that, that time saved because it really is a big, big time suck. But um, the reality is it's better for you as the person who knows the data to put your own eyes on it because, to be honest, leaving information out there that could be incorrect might actually be helpful in some cases. Um, and then making the decisions about where to remove the, the pertinent information could be useful. But the data removal guide by Michael Bazell presents you with hundreds and hundreds of sites that may have your data and ways that you can request that data to be removed um, and you can review. And as Micah mentioned, you may come across situations where they ask for validation in the form of more information or a, a driver's license and ID and things like that. And then you have to make a personal decision about what's right for you. But in the world of, of digital privacy, this is a great place to start. It's sort of the kind of thing that you are never really done with. So having that, that removal guide can help you as a checkpoint to go back and look at some of those services again. I will say anecdotally, um, after I had my intern remove uh, our phone number and address and other things from the internet, uh, we got a huge increase in spam phone calls and email scams and phishing and other things. So, because we had essentially validated that these emails and these phone numbers were actually valid. So, your mileage may vary depending on where you are in the world, but here in the United States, it, there there was even a penalty for removing yourself from websites. Yeah, so I'm glad I live in the UK. If I, I don't want to get political, but if I was living in, say, uh, Switzerland or somewhere else, that would be even better from a data privacy point of view. Yeah. It's, it sounds like in the US, it's tough, right? Very, absolutely. Very tough. Great for investigators and people that are ethical and take the time to consider the ramifications of things. Not so great for the people that need to hide. I know, I mean, we spoke about it last time. There's a huge interest in privacy. Uh, the privacy videos get crazy views on my channel, but you want to balance that with like the good side. So it's like, it's always nice to get you, your guys' perspective on privacy for like good people rather than, I mean, we're not trying to help bad people hide, but just for people who are tired of Google chasing or, you know, selling their data. It's always nice to get your guys' input. Guys, I really want to thank you for sharing. That was amazing. So top 10 tools, I've put links below. Mike and Griffin's training. Uh, if you can afford it, you know, go and support them for creating all of this free training and extra training to help all of us. Guys, thanks so much. Thanks for having Thanks. us.